Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is uh, episode 13. Uh, we're working on the topic, Heaven. And we're using this book by Randy Alcorn, titled Heaven. We're working our way through the book and discussing his... Uh, uh, writings on the topic of heaven. So if you haven't seen the previous 12 episodes, uh, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, each episode is uh, two hours long, so we've already talked about heaven for 24 hours, and uh, I don't think we're even halfway through this subject, so it's pretty amazing how much there is to say about it, because uh, well, first, let me, before I make that point, let me introduce uh, my uh, co-host, panelist here, uh, Brother Eric. Say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. God bless you. <laughs> uh, if you haven't subscribed to our channels, my channel is Sin City Preacher, and Brother Eric's channel is Jesus Night 72. Uh, but, uh, yeah, isn't it really amazing that uh, we've already talked for 24 hours and there's so much more to be, to be said about this and learn about heaven, and yet if you ask the average Christian, uh, tell me what you know or think about heaven, they'd probably cover it all in, what, 30 seconds or 60 seconds. That's the extent of their knowledge of it. <laughs> That's my experience with it. It's funny you said that because um, the book, when I picked up the book, um, I, I had purchased it over, over the Internet, and... Um, because I had, I had read a clipping of it because it interested me, something I'd looked up interested me, and I saw how big the book was, you know, how thick it was, how long it was, and I was like, wow, you, he has that much material about So even me, even for me, a person who really appreciates the topic, I I really was impressed with the with all of the different it's, – it's a quick read for anyone who's interested in the book. It's really it, – it doesn't feel like a long book. Um, it's a quick read. The topics are covered um, well, and they're chopped up into different sections very nicely. So, um, But it's funny how when you get into this topic, topic, as you delve into it more and more and you really consider things that are in Scripture, you, you begin to see how much the Bible really has to say about this. And, and, and people, I think, for the most part, don't really realize how much is actually in there if they, when, they, when they just touch the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've had uh, various reactions uh, to this, this study. I, uh, someone uh, said that uh, uh, two hours on heaven, I mean, like it was ridiculous. How could you talk about heaven for two hours? And I said, well, we've, that's not two hours. We've already talked for like 12 hours at that point. <laughs> right. And we just scratched the surface. So some people, uh, I, surprisingly to me, they're not as excited about the topic of heaven as, as I would think. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not just heaven in and of itself. It's, um, it's, it's, it's showing how the Bible reaches out from heaven into the lives that we're having now and into the rest of Scripture. And you can see how heaven is really, when you do a good comprehensive study of it, it's all through Scripture. I mean, it's, it's all through all aspects of the story, of the records, and of prophecy, too. It, I mean, it's all through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've made this point before, but it, it's such a uh, joyful subject. As, as we're discussing it. Uh, there's no other subject that I've ever discussed in, in scriptures that is as uh, joyful as discussing our eternal um, life. Well, well, you know, we know that we're gonna, we receive eternal life when we are put our faith in Jesus as our Savior, but when, once you've got this eternal life, it goes on for eternity. What are we going to be doing? What's it going to be like? So exactly. to, Learning about that is just such a joyful experience. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. Amen. Okay, so let me see. Find out where we left off last time. And uh, okay, I'm going to start with uh, chapter 15. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you're following along at the same time in this book, Eric, you're going to notice that I'm going to be skipping in this particular chapter. So I'll be skipping whole whole pages. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to be moving on to. Uh, page 149. First, let me read the title of this chapter here. Uh, the, the, one of the nice things I like about Randy Alcorn's book is that um, he has a lot of questions that are posed, and, and each chapter begins with a question. And uh, many of these questions are probably questions that we've all asked ourselves. Uh, but the question in chapter 15 is, will the old earth be destroyed or renewed? 
We've talked about just that to some extent before, and that's why some of this part I'm skipping over. Uh, I'm moving to page 149, the middle of the page, the meaning of new. As we've seen, the expression heaven and earth is a biblical designation for the entire universe. So when Revelation 21.1 speaks of a new heaven and a new earth, it indicates a transformation of the entire universe. The Greek word kainos, translated new, indicates that the earth God creates won't merely be new as opposed to old, but new in quality and superior in character. According to Walter Bauer's lexicon, kainos means new, uh, means new, quote, in the sense that what is old has become obsolete and should be replaced by what is new. In such a case, the new is, as a rule, superior in kind to the old, unquote. So uh, two things that I think are important there uh, in this particular uh, paragraph is that uh, uh, when it says he the new heaven and the new earth, that it means the universe, mm -hmm. all of creation. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, of course, what does new mean? It means uh, it's uh, that the other has been replaced, the other is obsolete. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it means, therefore, quote, not the emergence of a cosmos totally other than the present one, but the creation of a universe which, though it has been gloriously renewed, stands in continuity with the present one, unquote. We've mentioned this quite a bit before, that it's not going to like that the universe and uh, all of creation is going to be wiped out and non-existent, and then a brand new one is created. It's going to be... Um, destroyed to the sense that it would probably be unrecognizable as what it was and then right. re renewed to be uh, like the original creation, but even better. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul used the same word kainos when he speaks of a believer's becoming a new creation. Um, could you look that up, 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Sure. The new earth will be the same as the old earth, just as a new Christian is still the same person he was before. Different? Yes, but also the same. Hold on one second, and I'll get that for you. My computer's giving me a fit. Hold on a second. Uh, that was, um, what was that... Uh, that's 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 5.17. Okay. And that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, he's making the point that this word kainos... Uh, is used in both of these cases, the new heaven, the new earth, and also the new creature that you and I are. After our faith in Jesus, we, we mm -hmm. became a new creature, a creation, a child of God. Uh, and, but yet, we weren't wiped out and totally recreated as a brand new thing. I still have my memories. I still mm -hmm. have my identity. And even in eternity, we'll still have our memories and our identity. Mm -hmm. All right, anything you want to say about any of those points before we're going to move into Chapter six, uh, 16 next? No, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so in Chapter 16, um, the question, uh, the title of the chapter is, Will the New Earth Be Familiar Like Home? Uh, and here's a quote by Dallas Willard. The life we now have as the persons we now are will continue in the universe in which we now exist. Yeah. Well, I, I think what, what the thing that comes to my mind as we're going into this topic is that uh, really, uh, if, if you were, if you're, you're completely destroyed, non-existent, and then uh, created again, you wouldn't be mm -hmm. yourself. Right. Because uh, if you don't retain your identity and your memories and that, you know the, your personage, then then it's right. not it's not the same person. 
Well, I think it's also one of the one of those things that it gives you a better appreciation. I think I think we'll have a greater appreciation for what we receive from those gifts. You know, fr- from from get going into eternity, knowing the life that we had, experiencing sin, experiencing a life of of a world that is uh, corrupted by sin, and then having a greater appreciation for this new life that doesn't have that. I, I think that would be a great reward for people, at least in my opinion. I, th- I think that's something that in and of itself is a great thing to look forward to. To to have the prior knowledge of living in a world that we have, it's fallen, and now having that behind us, and we don't ever have to worry about that being the case again, and we can look forward to this life that was intended to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, and uh, at the bottom of the page it says, what our home will really be like. The uh, correction to the heresy of believing God's plan has failed is the biblical doctrine of the new heavens and new earth. Uh, The theologian René Pache writes, quote, the emphasis on the present heaven is clearly rest, cessation from earth's battles, and comforts from Earth's sufferings. The future heaven is centered more on activity and expansion, serving Christ and reigning with Him. The scope is much larger. The great city with its 12 gates, people coming and going, nations to rule. In other words, the emphasis is the in the present heaven is on the absence of Earth's negatives. Uh, while in the future heaven it heaven it is the presence of earth's positives magnified many times through the power and glory of resurrected bodies on a resurrected earth free at last from sin and shame and all that would hinder both joy and achievement had a little hard time following the that the way it was written there Um, but so the present heaven is uh, the absence of earth's negatives yeah, I mean the way I look actually um it makes sense to me. Uh, what he's saying the way I take it is and this is how I view it and I agree. I think that when when you read Revelation um everything that's happening in heaven, the narr- the general narrative in heaven and the communication in heaven and everything that's happening in heaven is based on the constant anticipation of the completion of everything God was supposed to do through prophecy. So everybody in heaven, that's all they're talking about, that's all they're asking about, that's all they're dealing with is this. They don't really get into the work of of what's going to be happening afterwards or anything. It's it's this constant anticipation of the fulfillment of all things and the completion of the of the end times to to prepare into moving to eternity. So that's kind of like I agree with them. I think like the current heavens more break from what we've been dealing with now to a waiting like like we call it you call it the intermediate heaven the the waiting period for the completion of all things to happen so then we can say kind of have the starter's pistol and then kind of go into eternity and start the real things that we were supposed to do in eternity i i kind of i agree with that i think i think it's um i think that's accurate i agree with that well i was thinking about the um the amount of time that passes in, in each of these kind of eras we know that uh since uh, Adam and Eve, uh, and between that and the cross, people who died, who put their faith in God to save them, uh, they went to this um, temporary heaven called paradise, Mm -hmm. uh, and and, uh, there was a gulf separating paradise from torments. Mm -hmm. We we learned a little bit about that in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Right. Uh, So all the people who were in that paradise until the cross, then Jesus went into paradise and took them up to this intermediate heaven that we have now. And then we go from the cross until right now, this is twenty, the year 2014. Uh, that amount of time, is, if you add it all up, uh, it's it's not even like one grain of sand on the, be- on the beaches of the earth compared to our eternal heaven right. here. Right. And so... Uh, Really, what they're what they're doing, what they've done before in paradise, and now up in the intermediate heaven, uh, during all this time, I, I don't know even know how time is kind of measured out up there now. If if all of that from the beginning to the time of our resurrection and the new heaven and new earth, maybe that whole time is is basically is like a matter of a second in in, in their understanding. And maybe it's it's happened. They got up there, and then all this time's passed. 
And as far as they know, maybe maybe only a second's pass, or maybe they can really see the all of time and everything. I'm not sure how that plays out, but I do know that what they're doing up there now, what they've done up to this point is, as you said, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's basically just anticipating for this mm -hmm. finished work to come in, to, the, to all of it. Uh, Jesus completed his work for our salvation, but now the the resurrection of the of us and the universe is is what they're all anticipating. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in fact, the, the next paragraph says, understanding and anticipating the physical nature of the new earth corrects a multitude of errors. It frees us to love the world the world that God has made without guilt, while saying no to the world's uh, corrupted by our sin. It reminds us that God himself gave us the earth, gave us a love for the earth, and will delight to give us the new earth. You know, you know, it's funny. That's that's something that um, always comes up, and I know it's a little bit, it's a little off, but it, but it's only if you think about it, if people will humor me and listen to this. It's like, it's like when you, when you, um, you read a book or a movie or see a movie or, a, or or I know kids, you know, the younger people involved in games. I like games too, and things like that. And and you are um, you're very regretful when you get something that you think is going to be really good. And what bothers you, it, it winds up really bad. And what bothers you is that it had the you could see the potential in it to be really good. And I, I equate that with the earth in its state right now. We look at the earth and we see, well, number one, how immense it is, you know, how huge it is, all the different attributes of earth, the different seasons, the mountains, the, the oceans, the rivers, the trees, the um, every little detail about the different kinds of animal life that God created, about human life, about the intricacies of the human body. And we see the we, – we're, we're thrilled and we love it for the potential it has – but it's constantly scarred by sin. You know, it's constantly ruined. It's it's not you can't quite love it fully because you want to, because you see how great it is and how wondrous it is. But at the same time, in its fallen state, you can't fully really appreciate it. And that's what I kind of equated to that kind of feeling. Because you you can see the potential to be wonderful, but you can't quite get it because it's in the state it's in. Yeah. And when you say it's fallen state, now, you know this. This relates back to what we've talked to in some of the recent episodes. Is that this fallen state is? We're not only talking about the fallen state of man, of humans, right. but all of creation is suffering from this fallen state. Uh, and and so when we see the world today, uh, there's something left over from paradise that's still beautiful, mm -hmm. but it's not as good as it was. There's uh, death, cor corruption, there's all, all kinds of things, not only within humanity, but with the animal kingdom, with the a plant life, with the earth itself, with earthquakes and storms and stuff. All this stuff we see is, well, that's not good. <laughs> you know, anyway, right. the earthquake, that's not good. Right. But, uh, uh, but, but we still, there's still a lot of beauty on the earth for us right. to get an idea of what, how it's going to be. I've, I've said before, I said, imagine the most beautiful place you've ever seen on earth and the happiest moment of your life mm -hmm. and then uh, imagine that that it's going to be like that in, in eternity uh, for those of us who are uh, have eternal life through our faith in Jesus in eternity the very most beautiful thing we've ever seen on earth the the happiest moments we've had that's just going to be like the norm or even like a that magnified multiplied many times greater than that in, throughout all of eternity, so yeah, yeah, we get really excited anticipating this future. Mm -hmm. um, he says, "Think for a moment what this will mean for Adam and Eve when the new earth comes down from heaven. The rest of us will be going home, but Adam and Eve will be coming home. <laughs> Only they will have lived on three earths: one fallen, no, one unfallen." One fallen and one redeemed. Uh, only they will have experienced, at least to a degree, the treasure of an original magnificent earth that was lost and is now regained. Wow, that is really interesting. 
Because they do, they, they have, they, they'll have three perspectives, and we, we, we will have only two. You know, it, it kind of makes you wonder because, and I believe this is the case, um, um, uh, 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 Jackson, who joins us often, he's mentioned that before. He talks about the upgrades. And one of the things I think people lose sight of is that they, they think that, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the animals, and he, he did creation and the, the creation account in, in Genesis. And they think that God is a God that just stops creating. He doesn't do anything else. But I don't agree with that, and I don't think the Bible says that at all. It says he rested on the, on the seventh day. Um, but at the same time, there's no reason for us to believe that God stops creating or intended to stop creating at that point. I think a future of upgrades, like Jackson puts it, um, was always in the plan. And that was something that, that Adam and Eve could have looked forward to seeing and being part of much quicker had the fall not happened, and then we're now going through everything we're, we're going through now. And so... I can only imagine, we, we see the wondrous creations that God has put before us now. When you look at the the smallest intricacies of, of insects and, and the, the, how complex they are, we talk about this often, but to, to imagine the things that God hasn't even gotten to the chance he's going to create more things well, that we're not even aware of yet. I mean, I'm, that, kind of, that really excites me. It, it, it shows that it, it separates the world, you know, the unfallen, as, you, as he called it, the state it originally started in, then it fell, and we the world we're dealing in now, and then the redeemed, which is going to, in my opinion, and what I believe Scripture teaches, is going to lead us back to the unfallen state, but then into a state of even better than that. It's going to it's going to be these wondrous new things that are going to come on board later that we are totally unaware of and couldn't even possibly fathom could exist. I mean, mm -hmm. that to me is exciting stuff. I yeah, I think that the um I really appreciate a um, this range of uh, people in our panel. Uh, I'm 63 years old, and Austin's 20, Jackson's 21, Mike is 22. How old are you, brother? I'm 41. 41. So we have quite a range of, of life experiences, and then... When, when Jackson uses the term, thinks of it in terms of upgrades, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't have thought to use that kind of word or think in that way, but I'm glad that he, you know, being in that age group where he's growing up with all the technology and like every couple of months there's a new product that's upgraded, that's the new version, that's even better than the previous one. Right. And, and it really makes me understand, uh, you know, what's going to happen. We are going to have a lot of upgrades. And right now, if you look at, uh, just in a computer or um, cell phones, uh, if you just go back one year and then two years and three years and so on, you compare them, uh, you, you think, well, five years ago they were, we really thought it was great, but looking back it's, it, it looks like simplistic and sophomoric and, and yeah. like, you know, almost prehistoric compared to what, what yeah. the new ones can do. And that's the way our body is going to be. That's the way the earth is going to be. All of creation is upgraded like that. And think of and think of the how incredible you know I'm that's I'm glad you equated it with that because when you think of how credible that incredible that is, I mean you're talking about we upgrade things at a rate and Daniel talked about this you know when when in the book of Daniel where it says in our time in the end times knowledge would abound people would be would go to and fro and well that's exactly what we have today I mean knowledge abounds it's the information age you know you you can't you go in your you want to know about something you go in your pocket you pull your phone out you look it up and you can find information about it I mean it's ridiculous you have and, and these are upgrades that are tainted by the limitations of man. We're, we're so limited, we don't even understand our own limitations sometimes. And God is completely unlimited. He has no limitations. He's, so you can imagine the rate of upgrade and the kind of upgrades that God would, would create. <laughs> I mean, it just it blows your mind. When you, I mean, I can't see how somebody would not be excited about this kind of a topic. It just... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm anxious. I wish I had could get some of those upgrades a little bit early. <laughs> I'm with you there, brother. <laughs> um, so the next question you ask is, when we open our eyes for the first time on the new earth, will it be unfamiliar or will we recognize it as home? Um, well, he answers the question, so let me go on. It says, as human beings, we long for home. 
even as we step out to explore undiscovered new frontiers, we long for the familiarity of the old, even as we crave the innovation of the new. Think of all the things we love that are new, uh, moving into a new house, the smell of a new car, the feel of a new book, a new movie, a new song, the pleasure of a new friend, the enjoyment of a new pet, uh, new presents on Christmas, staying in a nice new hotel room, arriving at a new school or a new workplace, welcoming a new child or grandchild, eating new foods that suit our tastes. We love newness, yet in each case, what is new is attached to something familiar. We don't really like things that are utterly foreign to us. Instead, we appreciate fresh and innovative variations on things that we already know and love. So when we hear that in heaven we will have new bodies and live on a new earth, that's how we should understand the word new, a restored and perfected version of our familiar bodies and our familiar earth and our familiar relationships. You know, you know something interesting real quick. There's something about there's something about nostalgia that God put in human beings. I don't know what it is, but there's nothing like it in the world when you revisit old things that maybe places you haven't seen in years or people you haven't seen or a song you heard when you were a kid or something you ate or a place you ate or there's nothing there's nothing else that quite gives us a feeling like that appreciation of something we experienced a long time ago. It's a very unique feeling and an emotional trait that humans have. And I believe God put that there for a reason. And that, and I believe that it's there for us to appreciate that also in the future, that we'll have nostalgia for places that are the same and yet different. They're going to be improved. They're going to be different. But I think we'll have those feelings about, to me, I don't know if other Christians, you know, they can, you know, feel free to comment about this, you know, but one of the things I think would be so interesting would be once everything's changed and everything's repaired and God has done his wondrous work and we've got everything in this new state, I'd very much like to go back to some of those places I was when I was a kid and see them in the new state. Or, or, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, it, I, to me, that's something I've always thought about and pondered. I always found that to be something interesting and comforting. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that goes along with the point he's making. That this, there's something about the familiar that uh, we, we want to hold on to. Even though we do like innovations and, and new things, we don't want to lose our, our, uh, uh, the things that we still love and value from the past. Uh, today's February 2nd, and it's the, uh, uh, it's the, uh, the birthday of the oldest friend I have in life. And I met him when I was 12 years old. Uh, Little League Baseball, I'm the catcher, and he hit the ball over everybody's head. He was on the opposing team. Uh, he hit the ball over everybody's head. It should have been a home run, but he was big and heavy kid, and he, he couldn't run that fast, so he's plodding around the bases, and they get the ball all the way back, and I'm holding the ball at home plate, and he's rounding third. But he wouldn't settle for a triple because he hit the ball up his head. So he wanted his home run. <laughs> yeah, he wants this home run, so he keeps running, even though he knows they have the ball. And he's he's like much bigger than me. And he just plows me over, but I kept the ball and he was out. And he said he said he introduced himself to me that day. <laughs> As he knocked, as he knocked well, me on my twice, butt, right? You know? I see I see stars and everything else, and I say, "Oh, this is Bill Cook." <laughs> well, we've been friends ever since. We ended up playing on the same team after that, and for years all through through high school. And even though he's moved away, he stayed in touch. So every year on his birthday and my birthday, we always call and talk. And, and there's a lot of nostalgia there. And and as I when I talk to him, and I can talk about things that no one else can relate to. And that kind of nostalgia is just a wonderful thing. I mean, I get it. I know what you mean when you're talking about how we really value this nostalgia. Um, another thing is I got married in Kauai. In, in Hawaii, the, the most beautiful Hawaiian island is called Kauai. Mm -hmm. My wife and I got married there at a place called the Fern Grotto. And it, it may be 
the most beautiful place on earth. I mean, it's certainly one of the most beautiful places, but I mean, I'd love to go back there and see how could God make that even more beautiful? <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's... Um, a common misunderstanding about the eternal heaven is that it will be unfamiliar, but that, that couldn't be further from the truth. The following chart compares widespread assumptions about heaven with biblically based characteristics of heaven. Okay, so in the chart, uh, um, okay, why don't I read the, the, the I'll read the left column, mm -hmm. and then you give the answer to the right column, and I'll say, I'll go at point by point, and, and then, then we'll, we'll elaborate if we want to. But it says, what we assume about heaven, we assume that there will be a non-earth, Okay, the right the right column compares that to what the Bible says about heaven, saying there will be a new earth. Okay. So rather than being uh, the the collective viewpoint of the world and the, even the the Christian church, most people their perception is that there's going to be a non-earth. It's we're not going to be on earth in eternity. So that's that's their perception. But the reality is there will be a new earth. <laughs> uh, what we assume about heaven is um, that things will be unfamiliar and otherworldly, like a spirit realm rather than a physical realm. And the Bible teaches us that the earth will be familiar and earthly, or heaven okay. will be familiar and earthly. <laughs> and what people assume is about heaven is that uh, we will exist as disembodied, disembodied uh, life form or spirit, spirit form rather than bodies. Mm -hmm. and the Bible tells us we will be a resurrected life form. Which which says which speaks to the fact that there it will be a new body, not a not disembodied but a new body. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then uh, we assume about heaven that uh, it, it's going to be everything will be very foreign, unfamiliar to us. And uh, the Bible actually teaches us that the the earth the earth and uh, heaven are going to be like home. They're going to feel like home, all comforts of home, with all the innovations of an infinitely creative God. Yeah. You know, that, that makes me think about, this is really true with me, probably more than most people, and that idea of home sweet home. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, one of the things that my wife and I uh, do not share is a desire to, to, to travel. She loves to travel. I mean, you mention any, going any place, any time, and she's ready to go. And for me, I'm just, I dread it. It's, just, it's not that I wouldn't like to be there. But the process of getting there is, is so laborious to me and unpleasant, and that I, I just try to try not to do it if I can help it. Uh, so the idea of home sweet home, there's nothing to me like if I go away or something, I do come. In, oh, I'm so glad to get home where I'm comfortable. This is I'm right at home. Mm -hmm. I, I I I can definitely relate to that. That's more my personality of that. And I have it's funny because I have a coworker who's a great friend of mine, very close friend of mine, a sister in Christ, and uh, and she's exactly like you're saying, like her like your wife is. She's she she's been all over the place. I mean, she's been to Greece, she's been to the Bahamas, she's been she's been all over the world, England. Egypt, she's been all over the place. <laughs> so it's like, to me, I'm more of a kind of, I'm a homebody. I like, nothing feels like home, and it's really more the hassle of going to any of these places than it is to actually be in there and experiencing, which would, put, which would be nice. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm anxious to travel in eternity because I think we'll be able to travel, but we won't have any pain. Like, my arthritis won't hold me back. Right. Sure. I absolutely. I won't need my CPAP machine to breathe while I go to bed. Right. You know? Oh, I can so. relate to that. My dad, my dad has a CPAP, so I can relate to that. He has to deal with that as well. He's a, uh... So, yeah, in the in eternity, I'm going to be very anxious to do a lot of traveling that I'm Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we assume about heaven that uh, we're leaving our favorite things behind. And the Bible teaches us we're going to retain the good things and and find the best ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but you know I, I love to golf. It's it's my main interest as far as uh, recreation, mm -hmm. and I try I usually try to golf once or twice a week and and um, things like that. That's my favorite thing. That's my favorite recreation. Now I wonder in. In, in eternity, on the new earth, will other things be so interesting and so uh, much better that I will, say, compared to golf, I say, why, why golf? This is much better. 
uh, I don't even need to golf anymore? Or will I say, I still love to golf, and the Lord lets me play on um, even better golf courses? So. I no, I, I agree, and I think part of what you mentioned, some of the reasons that people don't do the things they that they would find that they really love to do is because of their limitations, physical limitations, financial limitations. We have all these limitations on us, but you know, in eternity, it's not going to be like that. So who knows the doors that will open up to us to do all kinds of things we never experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, something we assume about heaven is that there is no time and space. And the Bible teaches that there will be time and space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously there's got to be space uh, for you to exist in a physical reality. It can't be non-space, some non-physical dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, and then time, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think I've been guilty of that in the past too. And from this book, and also from, I think, uh, Brother Joe Byron has made this point too that uh, that yeah there will be time. Uh, you know, Joe says that there's going to be sunrises and sunsets, but uh, I think the scripture says that uh, there'll be no need for for the sunlight because the glory right. of God will shine. Right. So I don't know how it's going to be, but I do think we we won't have to necessarily measure time by sunrises and sunsets. That cycle how we how we uh, uh, measure our time now. But um, the, the scripture does tell us that time we will have time and space in eternity. Um, now, what we assume about heaven is that everything is static. I'm not sure what and that I, means. I, static means it's it's just um, that's a little bit kind of well. His response to that is that the Bible teaches it's dynamic, and I think the static static means that um, it's going to be. Uh, made one way, and it's going to stay in that constant state, and that's the way it's going to be. It's not really going to change. It's not mm -hmm. really going to develop as we talked about. Um, I, I, I think that's a limitation people put on heaven that, that there's nothing scriptural behind it to back that up. The Bible does not teach us eternity is going to be static. It does not teach us that eternity is not going to have its changes and its it's um, variations through eternity. The Bible, in, in fact, I think, again, and this, this I'm just going by what I know is the character of God. God is a God of imagination. He's a God of creation. Um, he enjoys creating these things to share them with us. Um, I believe him being the great creator and the great imaginer uh, is going to go well into eternity, and we're going to get to see his unhindered imagination because we no longer have sin to hold us back. You know, we 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 won't be hindered by that. You know, he'll be able to give us the full breadth of his imagination and and be able to to uh, to show us all these new things that are going to happen. So I think it's really I think it's really robbing God of something when you insinuate that heaven's going to be static. I, I think it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I understand now that you've discussed this static versus dynamic and. Uh, uh, it, it is exciting to imagine, you know, what God's going to do in this, in this dynamic eternity, where it's, it, things are not going to just remain status quo constantly the same throughout eternity. Uh, what else will He dream up for? Uh, when you think of what He's already done in terms of our creation, the magnificence of the vastness of creation, and then down examining even the smallest parts of creation is mind-boggling to anybody who wants to dare to even think about these things. And oh, yeah. yet, how much more does he have store for us? We, we look at the universe, and the universe is God's way. The, what I say is the universe is God's way of telling us, guys, I'm just warming up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm so impressed now uh, that I can't, there's no words to really anybody can express to, uh, the wonders of creation. Uh, and then uh, we assume about heaven, uh, neither old, uh, like Eden, nor new and earthly, just strange and unknown. Uh, and the Bible teaches us actually that there will be, there will be both old and new. Uh, for instance, something simple um, comes to mind right away that Jesus told his disciples that um, he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until he drinks it again with them in his father's house. So clearly they're going to consume the fruit of the vine in the father's house, which is something that, you know, will it not exist in heaven? Well, clearly it will because he says they're going to consume the fruit of the vine in his father's house. So 
So um, these are old things. I mean, again, this goes back to something I've said before. It doesn't make sense for me, for me, for God to create all sorts of things that we love so much, the good things that we love so much, only to take them away and they're not around anymore. I mean, it just does, to me doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, yeah, it would be, on one hand, you'd think I'd be very disappointed if some of the things I really love are, are no longer uh, available or we no longer practice them. Uh, on the other hand, I think I can also imagine that maybe I would lose interest because other things are so much more interesting. I don't know how that, it's going to play out. That's a good point. That's a very good point. That's true. Um, what we assume about heaven, uh, there's nothing to do, and we're just floating around on clouds. Uh, the Bible teaches something very different, that there will be a God to worship and serve, a universe to rule, purposeful work and to accomplish, friends to enjoy. Uh, the big thing there, of course, being a God to worship. And guys, we're talking about worshiping him to his face. I mean, I mean, you know, we, we say and take for granted the fact that we have this line in Jesus Christ. You know, we have this lifeline, this the Holy Spirit that links us to God. And we can talk to God whenever we want to. And we pray to him whenever we want. And Jesus has given us that ability. But think about all the things that you've always wanted to say to God, to say to his face, you know, to say thank you for. I mean, it, it, it makes that relationship so much more personal when he's there before you and you can you can you know to his face say thank you for all these great gifts and all these things that you that you've received mm -hmm. yeah uh, thank you is probably my greatest prayer uh, I just I on one hand I, I kind of like to keep my prayer life a little bit private because you know Jesus cautioned us about this should be done in the closet so that no one's using it to try to show their great spirituality, you know. But sure. So I, I don't really, I, I kind of guard against expressing it, but I, while we're on the subject, I'll say that most of my time in prayer is just thanking God all day long. I mean, mm -hmm. I was when I was talking to my old friend Bill today on the phone on his birthday, I was telling him how happy I am. I'm, I said, I'm so happy that I'm, I'm almost giddy all the time. I'm just like laughing all day long because everything I do and everything I look around and see, I'm just saying, thank you, God, thank you. I'm just, I understand my blessings. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about our health problems. You know, he's had, you know, surgeries. I've had surgeries. We're all getting old and falling apart. And still, we're doing the best we can with our bodies as they're, as they're getting old. But, but uh, I say, yeah, it's easy to think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I choose to do, to think about the blessings, mm -hmm. and the blessings I have are just they're all around me. Everything I mean, I just I look at this lamp, I look at the clock, I think all these things that people didn't have in, in even you know uh, 100, 200, 300 years ago. They didn't have the simple things that we just look and we ignore. We just take it all for granted. The ease of our life. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I'm just spending all day just thanking God all the time. Well, it's you know it's easy to get caught up, you know, and and I can totally understand what you mean by you know you, you say you want to keep your prayer life, you know, it's meant to be kept private and things like that. And I think your private prayers are, but th but it's good to teach. And I think what you what you did there was great because it's always good to teach somebody proper prayer. It's always good to teach them and say, look, this is how you should pray. And one of the first th things we should always do is always thanks should be there because we so often focus on the wrong things that are going on in our lives, the bad things um, that we forget to say thank you. You for all the wonderful things that, like you said, we take for granted. And thanks should be always the first thing on our lips, I think. Amen. How's it going, guys? Well, let's welcome Brother Mike uh, Green uh, to the show. I'm glad you could join us, brother. Hey, Mike. How's it going, Eric? How you doing, bud? Every, everything's great. Uh, we're, uh, we're doing a little comparison chart here in Randy Alcorn's book. On one side, uh, I'm st stating what we assume about heaven, what without studying out heaven, what people commonly assume about heaven. Uh, and then Eric is reading the, the reality about what the scripture says about heaven. So we're going point by point. And uh, I'm glad you could be with us now, brother. Are you having a good day? Um, not too bad. Well, it's been a rough week, but praise the Lord, I'm here. 
Amen. Amen. That's what we were just talking about, perspective. Even though we have rough weeks, things to deal with, we, if we keep our blessings in mind to keep that proper perspective, we can still have joy. Okay, so what we assume about heaven is that uh, there will be no learning or discovery, um, instant and complete knowledge. And the Bible says that there will be an eternity of learning and discovery. <laughs> How does that strike your fancy, Brother Mike? Uh, that, that definitely is interesting. I, I've always uh, been under the assumption like, once we get to heaven, we just automatically have the biblical knowledge, and that's a good perspective to make. That uh, we'll be we'll be continuously learning. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm I'm fairly educated. You know, I've I finished high school, I finished college, and uh, I have a somewhat educated, but um, uh, most of the education I had in my formal education was laborious and I didn't enjoy it. I just had to do it to, to reach my goal. But I wasn't really studying things I had great interest in. But uh, since then, you know, I, I, over my lifetime, I've found all kinds of subjects I've been really interested in and I pursued studying and learning about them through my own. And uh, one of those great subjects I love is, is the scriptures. And uh, every time that I learn something, it is such a wonderful thing. It's exhilarating to learn something new. And when it comes to scriptures, when you, 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 I learn something new, I, you, I call it sometimes a nugget. Oh, this is another right. nugget. Or, or this is a, a revelation or an epiphany. It's, it's a new insight. There's many times I, I've read the scriptures you know, 20 times, 30 times, the same verse over, over years, read it over, and then the 35th time I read all of a sudden, revelation. I didn't even get it the first 35 times, the first 20 or, I read it, you know, and now I get it. And it's, it's isn't it exciting to yes. learn like that? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Also, uh, if, like, I, I listen to a lot of sermons and other talk, just talk to other people, it's, it, it's very interesting how either you've looked at that passage recently or you hear just a different way of someone approaching it and you're like, man, that really sticks out like it didn't it didn't before, like you're talking about the nugget, how, like, yeah, that, that, that the context just clicks all of a sudden. Maybe something you prayed about a month ago and someone speaks it so clearly. And, yeah, so I, I definitely enjoy those moments as well. Mm -hmm. So I've been studying the scriptures for... Uh since December of 86, how long has that been? 86, 96, 106, 20, uh, 23? No, no, 26? Yeah, 26 years, right? Sounds about right. Okay, so, so, so I've been studying the scripture for, for 26 years, and imagine if I'm that excited just continue learning over 26 years, I'm going to continue learning every day these new great epiphanies. Mm -hmm. Through eternity, yep. I don't even know how long eternity is. I can't even imagine how long it goes on and on and on. And I keep on getting this exhilaration from learning something new all the time. I've and heard we'll never, we'll, we'll never be omniscient. Only God's omniscient, so right. we will always continue to learn. Absolutely. I, I've heard from one of my friends. Uh, what don't what, what do you think we'll be doing that whole time, Mike? He, and he's like, don't you think we'd ever get tired of living forever? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're comparing things like that. Like the, we, that was the point we covered just before you, you joined us. I said the assumption is that there's nothing to do. We're just floating around in the clouds. Well, in fact, the very next comment in the list is going to cover that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I said uh, we assume that there's nothing to do. We're floating around in clouds, and then and, and then but the scripture says. No, we have God to worship and serve, a universe to rule, purposeful work to accomplish, friends to enjoy. Uh, so it's it's quite different than the way your typical person, even among all Christianity, the vast majority of Christians, they think it as your friend expressed it. I can't imagine the eternity when you get bored. That's the next point is we assume that eternity in heaven will be boring. And the Bible says it will be fascinating. Yeah. I don't know. It's 
It's going to be fascinating in so many ways. I mean, I, we, we could really, we could talk about just this one point, how fascinating eternity is going to be. We could probably just say, we're not going to talk, discuss anything else except that. Right? We could probably talk for a couple of hours Probably. about all the things that we think will be fascinating in eternity. Um, uh, but yeah, the, I had that perception, I think most people have the perception that no, we're just going to be some spirit, uh, spiritual existence in a, uh, a, a non-physical dimension, uh, either floating in cow clouds or just saying hallelujah all day and that's it for eternity. And gosh, that doesn't sound very appealing to, to most people. Even no. Even everybody who loves Jesus and loves the scriptures, that that wouldn't be very interesting. No, well, I don't think so. You know, it, it's it's um, what would be the purpose in that? There is no purpose. There's no purpose behind something like that. And we know God is a God of purpose. He doesn't do anything for no reason. He he is a God of purpose, and our lives have purpose. Our lives now have purpose. Our futures have purpose. Eternity is going to have a purpose. Just because we don't understand all the facets of it and we don't know them right now doesn't mean they're not going to be there. It just means we just don't understand it. And I think it's one of the the things that humans do that are incredibly wrong, which is they take the life they're living right now. Say, you know, if your friend was to ask that question, Mike, and say, you know, could you imagine your life the way it is right now with all the stuff you deal with and everything and living that forever? Wouldn't that wouldn't be very good, would it? Well, no, it wouldn't be. But that's not what we're going to have. <laughs> it's not, yeah. it's not, and that's how humans tend to put themselves in a box. They tend to put themselves in. They limit God. They limit eternity, and they put it in a in a small box that like we live in on this earth because it's all we really know. And that's kind of the whole point behind some of the comments we get. If people say two hours on heaven. Well, because I think it's fun to contemplate these things when you really see God in the way you're supposed to see God. You know, right. you see him for who he really is. Um, there will be, I mean, we only know about the universe. I mean, this is only what we know. We don't even know what we don't know yet. So this is where, there's, a, there's a whole other aspect of that that people don't think about. There's a whole other side of this that we don't even know. And on the so, vast, uh, on the vast scale of things, we are just a small, small uh, speck in this whole vast. Absolutely, universe. absolutely. I can only imagine what God has planned. I can't even fathom. It, it, it talks about in the scriptures the glory that shall be revealed. You know, nothing shall be compared to it in this present time. No. You know, you in your one sentence, you made me think of two uh, songs. I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. This is a contemporary Christian song. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I imagine being in front of Jesus for the first time, how you're going to be, react to that. And then the other one was, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the other point you made that made me think of a song. Oh, who am I? Mm -hmm. Why am I so significant to God? When we mm -hmm. compare my my being and we look at the universe and look at all creation. I'm I'm not even I'm not, not much more significant than a single molecule in the universe. Mm -hmm. Right. And yet, who am I that God should care so much about me and love right. me that He would become a man and die mm -hmm. for me? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's just it it does boggle my mind, and I'm just so I'm just so thankful. Amen. That, that is Amen. the truth. Um, so what we assume about heaven is that there's going to be loss of desire. And what the Bible teaches us is there will be a continuous fulfillment of desire. And this is a little bit kind of what Jackson was saying he had a little problem about because a lot of the a lot of the human desires today are kind of based on sin. They desire things that are sinful. But people have to remember in this state, in our state in heaven, in our new selves, in our new bodies, sinless we're not going to have the same desires. Our desires will be different. Our focus will be different. Um, I've heard it. I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. I've heard it preached one time that uh, our desire will continually be to please and glorify God, and it, it we won't that that sinful nature just it'll be not even part of us anymore. So we won't even have that. Uh, I guess that temptation to go go do those sinful things. Right. Yeah. Um. Well, as we go through this book, Randy Olcor's book, there's going to be things discussed like sexual desires and recreational desires and desiring foods, various types of foods and stuff. So these things we'll go into more detail later, but um, having a desire 
is is that necessarily some nasty thing? Like it's the same no. kind of thing as, as this Christoplatonism that we discussed in the past. Is that right. um, they introduced into Christianity the idea that everything physical is somehow right. evil and sinful? Only spiritual things are good, and physical things are evil. Um, well, now people say, well, even all of our desires are bad. But what what about our desire to touch someone? Like I like to hug my wife, and, you know, and mm -hmm. give her a kiss. Um, my desires and, my, and the, the the sensations you get by embracing someone, you know, uh, is that is that a bad thing that we shouldn't have that desire? Um, now, sexual desire, uh, even before I'm in heaven, my sexual desires have have diminished greatly over the, over the years. I'm thankful for that because I found it to be very distracting and <laughs> even destructive in my life. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so absolutely. it may sound it may, may sound uh, weird. Uh, hey, brother Austin. Hey, Austin. <laughs> brother Austin. Can no, you I don't think it's. I don't, I don't think it's weird at all. I think it's something that um, all you know, all men wrestle with that. I mean, it's a people wrestle with that. It's, I think it's unfair to say all men wrestle with that. I think men and women wrestle with that. It's it's something yeah. that the desires put there because God desired for us to procreate. And yes. and he wants wanted us to do that, so the desire was placed there for us to do those things. So no, it's in and of itself the desire to do that's not wrong, but we have to desire to do it in the right, in the right format, in the right scenario. You know that that's where the desire becomes uh, what God intended, and that's kind of and I'm glad you said that because that's kind of building right into what we said. Our desires are going to shift to do things in such a way that are pleasing to God, and they may involve. Yeah. Things we do for personal enjoyment and things of that nature. They may. Um, I can re I can relate to my desires changing. I use that as an example. I know it's kind of maybe maybe some people are uncomfortable even t talking about this. But the uh, when I tried to control that sexual desire myself, it was a horrible struggle for me for much of my life. But once the the desire went away naturally, uh, it, it was. Uh, a relief and it's a, it's, it's a burden taken off of me that uh, and I think I can imagine the same thing happened in eternity where maybe some of the desires that that uh, I have will just naturally go away and I won't miss them at all uh, and uh, uh, sexual things in heaven we'll discuss in a later chapter whether that's uh, something that could be considered for heaven or not but uh, first before we continue on let's welcome brother Austin or, hey guys how's everybody doing I've made your God bless everybody Hey, God bless you too, buddy. I'm I'm glad you could make it, brother. So, uh, uh, are you having a blessed day? Yeah, man. I'm just watching the game with my mom. Oh, I'm in okay. I'm in Denver right now, so we're kind of. Uh, it's not important, but they're losing the game pretty bad. So I thought I could hop in here for a little bit and talk to everybody. Oh, oh okay. All right. Well, I. Um, I didn't want. I realized that uh, some people really have a great interest in the Super Bowl, and uh, uh, there are are some people that would criticize you for that and, and say that your mind should only be on uh, spiritual things all the time uh, and I, I don't want to you know, try to impose that on anybody I think it's perfectly acceptable and healthy to have interest in the Super Bowl or or other you know recreational things in this world uh, but that's why I was saying I figured that some people might be very interested in the Super Bowl and might not be on the panel today so I'm glad you could join us even if it's only for a, t a short time Hey man, thank you. I just, I just always like football. It's just always it's been uh, family time. The quality time of the family is what we look at. Yeah, yeah, me too, brother. Me too. Yeah, and you're right. That's a, that is a great opportunity to, for families and friends to get together and you know uh, have a good time together. Okay, um, so we're comparing these assumptions and realities about heaven. And another assumption is that um, there's an absence of the terrible, but presence of little we desire. And actually, the Bible teaches us that there will be presence of the wonderful, everything we desire and nothing we don't. Mm -hmm. At least that's what he says there. I think you got to be careful with everything we desire again. A lot of people, <laughs> yeah. they're going by their human desire now, and you can't go by that now. Your desires are going to be different in heaven. Yeah. Um, well, have, now, innocent desires clearly and, and like okay you you like to bring up and a lot of people may think well that's kind of trivial you know Luke brings up golf and things like but that's not trivial I mean these are these are things that humans do for enjoyment well Austin was just talking about me and him were just talking about basketball I mean about football I mean these are things we do for for enjoyment there's nothing inherently wrong in sports and in, in, in to desire the fun of competitiveness and uh, play things like there's no reason to believe 
things like that would not be allowed or not be there because there's nothing inherently wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's true. And uh, but on, on the other hand, I can because of uh, uh, seeing how some of my desires in my lifetime have come and gone and run its course. Then I can also easily imagine now how in eternity some some of the desires I have even now uh, I may not have those same desires in the future and I won't miss them if I, if you don't have the desire you're not going to miss it are you right right okay I can I can kind of relate that to uh, to drinking I mean I guess I used to drink a lot beforehand and then at, it was pretty actually sudden after uh, I got saved that that went away. Yeah, that's good. I, I, you know, a lot of people try to uh, work at changing them, their lives after they get saved, and uh, I'll tell you honestly that uh, I've changed a lot. If you, if you really knew my life before and you compared my life now, uh, you'd see that there's a lot of changes. But I honestly have not tried to make one single change. It's never been anything based on my own effort. Yes, it's yes. just that God God has just done a work in me. There's some things he changed uh, instantly and some things he mm -hmm. changed gradually and mm -hmm. even now I know that there's still other things that God will change. That, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, So uh, uh, that's been my experience with it. All right, let's uh, I'll read this final point here about this comparison. It says, what we have assumed about heaven has reduced it to a place we look forward to only as an alternative to an intolerable existence here on the present earth. Only the, only the elderly, the disabled, suffering, and persecuted might desire the heaven we imagine. But the Bible portrays life in God's presence in our resurrected bodies in a resurrected universe as so exciting and compelling that even the youngest and healthy of us should daydream about it. Yeah. I wonder how many people do though. It's uh, I, I really know from from the time we've been doing this study we've learned that uh, there are very few people who are daydreaming about it, about eternity. Right. One thing I think about is uh, I think you said we'll cover it by Luke, the rewards. Will well, we cover that? Will we cover that in the book, or did did we? Oh, uh, will we? Will we? Uh, I don't know if we will, but go ahead and, talk, and say something about it. That, I, that's I, what I. Sure. That, that's what catches my mind a lot. You know what? Possibly could be all these wonderful rewards, and you know what we get already when we go there. I mean, the salvation. You know, you you work for rewards, but I mean, everybody that's saved also gets entitled rewards. You know, the there's no more evil, there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, and I understand that. You know, there's. There's going to be tears at the judgment seat of Christ, but that's because you know they, we could have did so much more, and that's that's for every believer, I, I I really think. But most believers, you know, will have maybe a deeper surge of wow, I'm I really live my life in vain, you know, I could have did so much more. But I know I'm thinking, man, these these wonderful rewards. I mean, how could you know with salvation the greatest gift, you know, and then you know Christ always earnestly, you know, strive to work for rewards. You know, I I can't really imagine what would be better than that already, but. We got ruling over kingdoms and nations, and I can't really think about wealth. You know why that would be a, a big reward, but it's um it's an interesting subject that I, I usually focus on sometimes. Yeah, uh, I don't think the Bible is very clear. There's it's a lot of symbolism when it discusses rewards. It talks about receiving treasures in heaven. It talks about at the bema seat receiving gold, silver, and precious gems. It talks about five different crowns that we get from things we've done after we got saved. Um, but what is a crown? Uh, what, what's the gold, silver, and precious gems and these treasures? What, what is that really? I mean, can we, could we, I don't know if there's any way of us really trying to translate that into some describing it any further than what it is. It's very vague, but I'm sure it's something that we will value greatly. Right. Amen. Okay, um, he says, uh, no wonder Satan doesn't want us to learn the truth about heaven. If we fall in love with the place and look forward to the future that God had, has for us, we'll fall more in love with God 
and will be emboldened to follow him with greater resolve and perspective. Yeah. I, uh, I was reading ahead earlier today, and there's another chapter coming up here pretty soon that got me really excited. I mean, I was, I was weeping with joy. It was just made me so, so excited. And it's it kind of, it's, it's related to this point here that he made is that, uh, yeah, you just, I'm sure that Satan doesn't want us to mm. understand what we have to mm. look forward to and be thinking about it all the time. He, he loves for ever, all of us to be ignorant of, of uh, what God has waiting for us who put our faith in Jesus. And I, I just like to add that, uh, like you kind of said before, like ha having, you know, certain in, uh, enjoyment from some of the things in this world isn't wrong, but I, I think that he wants, you know, I know that he does, he wants us completely, uh, I guess, submersed in this world and not doing anything for Christ at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're getting into. We're going to start entering into the the subject that I was just referring to that I I read ahead earlier. I like to read ahead to, to basically so that I can kind of censor out anything that I think is either too redundant or something that uh, I think is worth just skipping over. So I, I'm moving on to uh, chapter 17. Um, uh, Ron, I did have a question real fast, just real fast before we move on. Uh, yeah. Will believers, uh, or sorry, the saved, will we be assigned jobs in the millennium? Uh, Eric? I would say um, when it talks about ruling and reigning um, in, in the period of the millennium, in different facets and different capacities will rule and reign with Christ, under Christ. Um, obviously, that's going to be some job of, of some sort. I mean, to to um, either deal with the nations. To I mean, I, I don't have specifics for it. Is I mean, there, there's nothing that pins down you know specific jobs for what people will do. But I mean, it's one of those things where you can kind of imagine things that may be needed. Um, in the time of the millennium, when you consider all that the world's just gone through through the tribulation and the and the restructuring and how things are going to be built back up going into the um, uh, you know people beginning to repopulate the earth again in the millennium you know, after after the tribulation where things have been completely ruined. Um, so I mean I mean I always saw it in like a, um, a leadership capacity to those on the, on the earth, you know, guidance, uh, teaching, you know, different things like that. I mean, there could, there could be things far greater than that. Right. Yeah, well, there there's uh, future chapters that will go into more detail on your question. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, okay, we're starting chapter 17, and I'm going to go to the middle of that page. It says, um, the magnificent theme... Oh, by the way, the question of the title of this chapter is, uh, what will it mean to see God? The magnificent theme of beholding God's face shouldn't be poisoned uh, by dull stereotypes and vague, lifeless caricatures. I hope we can now approach the topic of our eternal relationship with God with the richness and vitality it deserves. And here he has... Scripture, he says, quote, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's Psalm 63, verse 1. We may imagine uh, we want a thousand different things, but God is the one we really long for. His presence brings satisfaction. His absence brings thirst and longing. Our longing for heaven is a longing for God, our longing that involves not only our inner beings, but our bodies as well. Being with God is the heart and soul of heaven. Every other heavenly pleasure will derive from the and be secondary to his presence. God's greatest gift to us is and always will be himself. That gets us to that song. Remember, uh, uh, imagine. What was it? Imagine or uh, what was the song I, I mentioned earlier? Uh, oh, I, I can only imagine. I can only yeah. I can only imagine. 
Uh, let's ask that question for a moment here. The very first time that you see Jesus face to face, let's say you're, you go, you're, you're in eternity, and the first thing you meet is, first one you meet is Jesus himself. And I can only imagine what will you, how will you react to that? I've thought about it before, and almost like an instant, like hit the ground kind of moment, like just in awe of our being in front of our Savior, face to face. Just, I mean, just it's it's like trying to express how you would respond to any moment that you've never experienced before in your life that will put you in such a, an intense state of awe that you may not be able to respond. I mean, in my, my I, I tend to... Oh, good one. I, 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 yeah, I, that's exactly... Yes, thank you. Right there. That was great. That, that, I mean, I always pictured myself really as a deer in the headlights. <laughs> just kind of locking up like a bad engine, just kind of... <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm just, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to be so blown away and stunned. I think I might just be frozen there, just I, speechless. I don't know what I, I can't even, I could not predict for you what I'm going to say. <laughs> I really don't, I don't know. How about Austin? Any ideas? Yeah, I would just say, you know, that it's such a powerful thing to even begin to imagine what it would be like. I just want to say that for everybody, it's going to be, that much more powerful because we'll be in that, you know, we'll be out of our sinful body. So, I mean, we'll have the full experience. It'd be like, you know, the highest potent drug you could think of. And it's just that purity of the, of the sinless, you know, pure body that we're in. I mean, like it's, it's just going to magnify and increase tenfold about when we experience that. So, I mean, it's going to be powerful for everybody. And yeah, you know, uh, something, something Austin just said was great. It, he, the way he put it, it's going to be like, I mean, because I mean, we, I mean, we look at it in the sense of like the rapture, for instance, I mean, for me, it's going to be almost like in in my human mind, I see it as something that's like sensory overload. You're hit with so much at one time that it's like, how do you even deal with this? I mean, because you're not even going to be yourself anymore. What Austin said was a great point. I mean, it, you're not going to be yourself anymore. You're 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 this. You, you're now changed. You're now in your perfected body. You're in your perfected spirit. You're now in the presence of suddenly in the presence of your Savior. You know you're in in uh, going into heaven. You're going. I mean, it's it's sensory overload. You're hit with everything at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, that's why the the the. the title of the song, I can only imagine, uh, uh, we can't we can't really conceive of, of how we'll react. We can imagine and we can ponder it, but who knows how we're going to really react. I remember uh, an old friend of mine told me that uh, this question was asked at a conference one time, and uh, there were, uh, let's say there's like a conference of 50 or 100 people in the audience, and they asked everybody to answer the question, you know, how will you react when you first meet Jesus? And uh, uh, everybody was like, to do it. And they were falling down on their face. They were raising hands and saying hallelujah and all this stuff. And uh, and my friend said, he, he raised his hand and said, I've got a question. I've got a question. <laughs> and the guy, the guy that on the leading the group, he says, no, you tell us. You're supposed to show us your reaction to if you meet Jesus. He said, "This is my reaction." I said, I, I, "Jesus, I got a question." <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. another. That's another thing. Just imagine, you know, how many questions. I mean, you're gonna have for, for the Lord. <laughs> be like coming, yeah. up, coming up with the list. I, hey, I, I've this been bugging me. I yeah, asked you, and you uh, said, uh, "Answer my uh, prayers now." <laughs> I, I oh, think man. that was a. That was a clever little thing he said, you know, but on the other hand, I, I was a little rubbed wrong by it because I thought, <laughs> wait a second, I, I think that your first reaction is not going to be, hey, start asking Jesus a question. I think your first reaction is you're going to be in so much awe and dumbfounded and deer in the headlights and, and just whatever else. I don't think you're just going to be like, oh, this is just an ordinary situation. Let me, oh, Jesus, i got some questions for you. You know, that's a little bit ar arrogance, I think, there. What if it was uh, kind of like all the different ways that people get saved? Like some people cry, some people smile, some people just silent, some people uh, jump, some people uh, 
you, you get what I mean. There's all different types of reactions sure. to salvation. Could, I mean, it could possibly be the same with Jesus. That's a very good point, point Brother Mike. Uh, I think that's really got to be the answer. That uh, I don't think there's going to be a uh, universal way of reacting to mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. who, who knows? But uh, I'm excited about that time. So then on uh, page 166, it says, uh, and ancient, no, <clears throat> ancient theologians often spoke of the, quote, beautific vision, unquote. The term comes from three Latin words that together mean um, a happy making sight. Uh, the sight they spoke of was God. That's uh, Revelation 22.4 says of God's servants on the new earth, they will see his face. Uh, to see God's face is the loftiest of all aspirations, though sadly for most of us, it's not at the top of our wish list. If we understand what it means, it will be. Hmm. Yeah, uh, as I said, I read ahead, and I know that as we go through this point here, that uh, uh, when we finally do see the faith in God, meet God face to face, that uh, I can't imagine anything more significant, more important than this. I mean, of all the things we can imagine about heaven, you know, all the questions we have and all the things that we'll be learning and experiencing, what really can compare to being with God personally? Uh, to be told we'll see God's face is shocking to anyone who understands God's transcendence and inapproachability. In ancient Israel, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and he but once a year. Even then, according to tradition, a rope was tied around the priest's ankle in case he died uh, while inside the Holy of Holies. Why? Well, God struck down Yuza for touching the Ark of the Covenant in Second Samuel, uh, who would volunteer to go into the Holy of Holies to pull out the high priest if God slew him? <laughs> uh, when Moses said to God, show me your glory, God responded, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face n must not be seen. That's in Exodus 33. Have you ever spent much time thinking about that time with Moses and God? <laughs> there was another um, passage. I don't remember the exact uh, scripture, but I remember the transfiguration on the mount. When they, uh, yeah, when Jesus went up to pray and they couldn't look, it, it, I don't remember the exact passages, so to properly uh, present the context, but that was another moment that I thought of when you just brought that up. Mm -hmm. Well, I've often wondered about that verse with Moses and not being able to see God's face, but he could look at him as he passed by and see his his backside, but not his face. And what is, uh, uh, you know, if God is a consuming fire, I'm thinking God for God wanted to protect Moses from being consumed from his by his glory. Uh, so maybe that's why he had to turn shine the glory away or something. Amen. I always like that verse. Um... Uh, Exodus 3.14, the great I am, and mm -hmm. Moses asks, what should I call you? I am that I am. I think mm -hmm. that's also a good verse for people to understand to uh, to be yourself. You know, we always, uh, you know, that, a lot of people interpret things a lot differently, but that always spoke to me as like, you know, always be yourself because, you know, God just existed as himself, and all these people want him to, oh, give us your name, or what holy name should we call you? Just, I am that I am, you know, and then a lot of people always look at that the same way, you know, they always try to live another persona or take on somebody else when in reality we should just be ourselves. Mm-hmm. Amen. Uh, yeah, that's a, 
I don't know. A few people are well. Sometimes you you got to not be yourself. You got to like bite your tongue, I guess, and, <laughs> and, and, and restrain yourself. But uh, there is a lot of also a lot of deception going on, and sometimes you don't really you don't really know people as you thought you did. So, Amen. It says yeah. uh, Moses saw God, but not God's face. The New Testament says that God quote lives in unapproachable light whom no one can see or or has seen or can see. That's first Timothy six sixteen. To see God's face was utterly unthinkable. That's why when we're told in Revelation twenty two four that we'll see God's face, it should astound us. For this to happen, it would require that we undergo something radical between now and then. The obstacles to seeing God are daunting. Quote Without holiness, no one will see the Lord, unquote, Hebrews chapter 12. It's only because we'll be fully righteous in Christ, completely sinless, that we'll be able to see God and live. Not only will we see his face and live, but we will likely wonder if we ever lived before we saw his face. To see God will be our greatest joy, the joy by which all other things will be measured. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll go on unless you have something to say about that. Just a, a point that I, I mean, of course we brought it up over and over again, but I guess it's good to address that that particular verse is another one that's taken out of context to say, you have to perfect your flesh in order to be presentable before God. The whole, the, the the part about holiness in Hebrews. So that that's just something I've I've heard brought up and mentioned to uh, people trying to say you could lose your salvation. I've heard that mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, w this verse without holiness, no one can see God is is a common verse used to uh, to um, uh, promote the heresy that. Uh, we have to work for salvation, and we have to work to keep it. And uh, we know that holiness, that uh, the only holiness that satisfies God is real holiness that we get imputed to us from Jesus, not our own holiness. Our own, our own holiness or goodness is is like filthy rags compared to the, the glory of God. So we need Jesus to impute His righteousness to us, and then we're holy, uh, and then we're acceptable to have look at God and, and yes. have communion with God. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, brother. It, it is a problem verse that a lot of people use to, uh, uh, you know, promote that heresy of works. Um, then I'll go to page 167. It says, this is the wonder of our redemption, to be welcomed into the very presence of our Lord and see him face to face. What will we see in his eyes? Though we cannot experience its fullness yet, we can gain a foretaste now. Quote, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Unquote. Hebrews chapter 10. Quote, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Um, Hebrews chapter 4. We shouldn't read these verses casually. For they tell us something wonderful beyond comprehension that the blood of Jesus has bought us full access to God's throne room and his most holy place. Even now, he welcomes us to come there in prayer. In eternity, when we're resurrected beings, he will not only permit us to enter his presence in prayer, but he will welcome us to live in his presence as resurrected beings. Hmm. So uh, again, these verses uh, su support this this fact, this doctrine, that uh, in order to be righteous and to be able to commune with God, to see God, to live with God, uh, to have a relationship with God, uh, the only way that's available is not through our own efforts, but by putting our faith in Jesus, and we get this imputed righteousness. Hallelujah. I love that concept. You know, that's such a cool thing real fast. It's just that uh, impution. You know, we, you think about it, it's just really cool, you know, that we, 
I know a lot of people use the wallet thing, and then I like to look at it as like a jail record. You know, you have this record, and it's, you know, tons of write-ups and a long criminal history. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have this perfect record of Jesus Christ, and it's just set over it. And then every time God looks at us, he looks at us through Christ. I mean, what a blessed, holy, loving God would do such a thing to have mm -hmm. such a wonderful gift like that. I mean, that's such a cool concept of how we just get that imputed righteousness right to us. Mm -hmm. kind by, of by, faith, by faith, too. By, um, by real faith, right. by faith. I've kind of viewed it in a similar sense. You mentioned the jail record. I've I've kind of imagined like a, a courtroom, and that you know, because it's called the judgment, and then you got all the you got all these you know citations and 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 uh, criminal charges against you, and and you can't pay that fine by just saying, well, I, I did some good things too, and then Jesus is right there saying, I'll pay, I paid the fine for you, and. You just gotta trust me. I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Scripture explains it a lot of ways, and then uh, we who read the Scriptures try to explain it in our own words. Um, there's a lot of ways of, of, of seeing this uh, imputed righteousness. Uh, we're cut. We're clothed in His righteousness. His uh, the robes, white robes of righteousness. His we're covered in His blood. Is the right, righteousness, uh, or that our sins and iniquities He will remember no more because they were uh, uh, charged to Jesus' account instead of ours. And, um, but however a person uh, wants to explain it or understand it, the important thing is that it's not by our own righteousness that we are ever going to be acceptable and and uh, accepted by God. It's it's only by putting our faith in Jesus. That's the only way. Yes. Um, David says, "Quote: One thing I ask of the Lord, that is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life." to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple, unquote. Psalm chapter 27. Uh, David was preoccupied with God's person and also with God's place. He longed to be where God was and to gaze on his beauty. To see God's face is to behold his beauty, which is the source of all lesser beauties. Well, I think the two things that stick out to me on this is the, the magnificence uh, of this uh, glory of God, this beauty or glory, uh, and but then also the idea of a face. Now, we know that um, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, and he had a body with a face, and we know that he does exist. Uh, we believe he still exists with his body, in this intermediate heaven, and you'll have a body in eternity. So, in that way, we can see God's face, the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, do you think, though, that God the Father, or God the Spirit, is going to reveal himself as a face? You know, in classic art, you know, they have God portrayed as a, like a Santa Claus figure, the long, gray, white beard, and... Uh, uh, do you think that's what that's what it means by the face of God or or could the face of God be some kind of a symbolic thing and the and it's just the glory of God instead of his face it's in, as a face I, I, it could po possibly be a, a literal face I guess because it says we're made in the uh, image of God so yeah well um, brother Joseph said that uh, we were talking about uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, Jesus has a body because in the intermediate heaven you see him standing up and sitting down, and for him to stand up and sit down, he had, there has to be a physical place to do it, otherwise he'd just be like floating in a dimension. So uh, it's a physical place where he stands up and sits down, and he's on the throne, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and, and, and uh, uh, Joe says that in uh, Revelation, in the in eternity, in the new heaven, new earth, that, that there's two thrones, one for Jesus, one for the Father, and there's not one for the Holy Spirit. So he's concluding that the Father is also manifest as with a body. Uh, I don't know that that's the case, uh, but that gets us to the question of 
um, Theophanies and, and Christophanies. Do you, do you know the terms and what they, they mean? Uh, no, I don't. Yes, Go ahead, Theophanies, Theophanies are um, appearings of Christ uh, before before his actual first coming, appearings of Christ in different forms. Um, God manifesting himself in a physical nature, uh, for instance, the burning bush, the, the – um, uh, di different different uh, manifestations of Christ in a physical form uh, in other ways prior to his birth. Oh, okay. Is the best way I could describe it. It's, well, uh, I, I don't. I other, I other, other things that symbolize him. I'm sorry, things that symbolize him, like um, the temple, for instance. Um, the temple, the temple sacrifices, the, all those things were kind of forms of Christ in and of themselves and confirmations of what he was going to do in the future. Well, I, I'd say the second point you made there would fall under category called pictures and shadows of, of Christ, uh, of, of what this blood sacrifice would accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, but the theophany or Christophany, um, some people think it's important to make a distinction between the two words, and some people would use them interchangeably. But theophany means that God, the, the Father, manifests himself as a man, like he was walking with Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden. He was walking, therefore he had to have a body to walk, and that was God the Father, and therefore it's a theophany. Hmm. Uh, and then the Christophany uh, narrows it down further and says, no, these manifestations of God, uh, pre-incarnation of Jesus, before his birth, uh, when God showed himself as, as a, uh, with a body, it was always Christ. Therefore, these are Christophanies, Christ appearing with his body before his birth. Um, so so I, 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 wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't argue either way, which way is correct, if they are interchangeable or not. But I forgot why I was mentioning that. Uh, we, whatever point we were just making, I, for some reason we were, I asked that question. We were talking about the face of God. Oh yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, we we're talking about the face. So, so um, if if the the term theophany is, is is correct, and that means that God the Father manifests Himself with a body, then He would have had a face uh, in the Garden of Eden, and that would that would mean that uh, Jesus. We not only see the face of Jesus, but it's possible to see the face of the Father. Uh, but I'm not sure that we can conclude that or not. Guys, um, I just want to say thank you for the hangout. I, I'm going to go spend some time back with my family. Much love, everybody. Um, thank you for letting me have a big God bless everybody. Uh, salvations by grace through faith alone. And um, uh, thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Brother Austin. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Austin. Have a good one, Austin. Take All care, right. brother. Okay. Um, God who is transcendent became imminent in Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, quote, God with us, unquote, Matthew Chapter 1, God the Son pitched his tent among us on earth, on our earth, as one of us, John 1.14. I've never heard that translation. Uh, that I think that's supposed to be, he dwelt among us in, in KJV, right? John yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. So, yeah, he pitched Yeah, I'm not, so, I am not. don't know if I'm convinced with that translation either. I'm not, yeah. I, um, I got it. Uh, I see what they're trying to say, but yeah, yeah, um, and dwelt among us, and we beheld. The word was made flesh, right? And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The yep. glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Yeah, so you can see the liberty that some of these uh, translations take, or or paraphrases take. It says, "God the Son pitched his tent among us, on our earth, as one of us." I mean, I don't, I wouldn't argue that the, the premise is wrong. It's just that. Uh, Seems to be taking a lot of liberty with the translating of it. Mm. Without even going into, uh, you know, like the the argument about it, if you were just to take it as a whole, as uh, I guess going to the root of the Bible translation, that I think that just there's some very good God fearing uh, men and women who, on the translations of these Bibles, want to simplify it in order for people to understand it more, but you lose some of the context when you do that. Yeah. Um, I, I find in the KJV, not only, I, I, 
I've been asked my question on these translations in the past, and I held the, the KJV only viewpoint for many years, and then changed my attitude, my mind about it, and thinking that uh, I, I want to look at a lot of translations. But if 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 I was put in a position where I say, look, Luke, you've got to choose. You can only have one translation. Which one are you going to take? I'll take the KJV. I th think it's the most trustworthy. And however, the the there's pros and cons where the KJV, even though as I said earlier without bragging, I, I am educated, even even saying that, that language is harder for me. And there's certain ways, the words and phraseology that are archaic, that are not used to today, that are it's harder for me to understand. Right. And so I find it helpful to look at um, a modern translation in those cases. Um, uh, uh, um, but the, the the thing I like about it not only is I like the trustworthiness of the KJV, but I like the the beauty of it. That language is more poetic. Mm -hmm. And what I hear and and he dwelt among us, compared to he pitched his tent among us. It just kind of you know it's like chalk on a chalkboard. It, just, <laughs> it, 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 it irritates me to have some of my favorite verses, my favorite expressions like Shakespearean language brought down to like you know rap a rap song. Yeah. I, 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 that was a great point. I, I agree. Uh, another thing I was gonna say is, uh, oh, I just I just lost my train of thought there for a second. But um, yeah, I going with the oh, the the difficulty of understanding some of the words. I found that studying the King James has actually uh, broadened my vocabulary on on some of the language used. Oh, and that was my last point. I'm, I'm having like little brain clicks as I'm going along here. It's okay. Uh, I've I've talked with a couple people. I've shipped Bibles to uh, in Africa, and they actually the way their culture is, they're brought up with a more Shakespearean English. They learn African first, then they learn Shakespearean English uh, in school there, so they can read through the King James no problems. They, they it's actually more natural to them than a modern translation. So I found that interesting. I got because I was I was referencing uh, the uh, Webster's dictionary to one of them, and he's like, "Nope, I don't need it. I I, uh, I have no problems understanding the king the the old English language." I'm like, "Okay, well." Yeah, this is one of the points I was made years ago to one of my friends uh, when he got saved, and he uh, uh, wanted to start studying the Bible, but he and I was KJV only. I was really imposing this on him, and and he couldn't understand it, and he tried and tried, and finally someone else told him to read an NIV or NASV or something, and he, he started reading it, and he understood it. And I, I thought, well, I said, look, Tony, uh, if you were uh, taken right now to uh, some suburb area of, of London, England, where they speak a really strong English and, let's say, some kind of like Cockney-type accent or something, right. and you, you move there, Probably the first few months, you wouldn't have an idea what they're talking about. Uh, but but if you live there for two, three, four months, you'd understand it and it would become natural to you. So my <laughs> yeah. advice is just keep reading the KJV, and then it, pretty soon it, it will you will begin to understand it. But uh, he never did that. But he was able to and uh, study and learn a lot uh, apart from the KJV. Uh, so yeah, part of it is true that your point is that uh, uh, if a person is diligent and they stick with it, then they, it certainly becomes easier. However, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I would not want to like curse someone and say, "Don't no. you dare, don't <laughs> you dare look at one of those other modern translations ever." And, and that's uh, that's one thing I found. I run a Facebook group online that, and I, the main goal of it is to encourage people to read the King James and to uh, to donate it and. That's that's been a, a battle I struggle, especially many others who are promoters of the King James Bible. They want to immediately, you know, like almost go on the attack. I'm like, hey, you got to be, you got to have some grace for people who who uh, don't have the same viewpoint as you do. And basically, uh, I try not to tear. I, that that's been the one rule. I try to have it only edifying towards others, especially if they, you know, uh, a friend. His name is. Uh, well, I won't mention his name because he may not want me to mention his name. But a friend of mine uh, has been really good on keeping me in check on that. Um, 
hey, you know, Mike, I, I read the NIV, and I know your viewpoints on it, and but I really appreciate your your spirit of humility on the on the subject and how you how you approach it. So I guess that's just some of my thoughts on on that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, he's using. I don't know what translation he's using. He says, "God the Son pitched his tent among us on our earth as one of us." And KJV says, um, "God was he was manifest in the flesh." No, no, he uh, he was made flesh and lived and dwelt among us. Uh, so whenever we see Jesus in heaven, we will see God, because Jesus Christ is God, right. and, a per and a permanent manifestation of God. Uh, he could say to Philip, "Quote: Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father." Unquote. John fourteen verse nine. Certainly, then, a primary way we will see the Father on the new earth is through his Son, Jesus. Jonathan Edwards emphasized Christ as the member of the Godhead we will see. Quote, The seeing of God in the glorified body of Christ is the most perfect way of seeing God with the bodily eyes that can be. For in seeing a real body, that, that one of the persons of the Trinity has assumed to be his body and that he dwells in forever as his own, in which the divine majesty and excellency appears, as much as tis possible for it to appear in outward form or shape." Unquote. That was uh, written hard for me to understand. Jonathan Edwards wrote that. But he's, he's just making the point that when we see Jesus, that uh, what, what better way to see God? There's no better way to see God than to see Jesus. Right. So uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to uh, see the face of the Father, but uh, uh, even if we see Jesus and not the Father, uh, we'll, we'll see God and the, the full glory of God. Uh, yet Jesus said, quote, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, unquote. That's Matthew 5, 8. And in Revelation 22, 4, when it says, quote, They will see his face and name, his name will be on their foreheads, it appears to be referring to seeing the face of God the Father. And uh, it says in John 4.24, God is spirit. Uh, biblical references to God's body parts, such as the eyes of the Lord or God's arms, are figures of speech. Yet in some sense, it seems that Moses saw the bright essence of God himself, even without seeing God's face. Is brightness really part of God, the Father's essence, or is it a form in which he chooses to reveal himself to physical eyes? I don't pretend to understand how we will see the Father's face, but it seems that in some sense we will. <coughs> yeah. So uh, Randy Elkhorn doesn't have a, uh, a real strong answer uh, to the question either. Uh, but I know that I'll be perfectly satisfied. I know that uh, uh, meeting Jesus face to face is going to be sufficient to see the face of God, and uh, in what form or manner that we see uh, the Father. Uh, I guess we can only imagine that. Maybe it'll be like the Shekinah glory. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is it is interesting though because it says, you know, it's just something that kind of peak the thought that for God is a is, uh, is a spirit they that worship him that it was John 4 24 I was looking at when you mentioned that for God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth that's not verbatim but it makes you think that of his appearance well, I've, often, I've often wondered when, if we think of the Father as spirit and then the Holy Spirit as spirit, do we have two spirits? And then we have one body, Jesus Christ, and the Father and Son are both spirit. I mean, the Father and the Holy Spirit are both spirit. Why would it be necessary to have... Well, it talks about Jesus that way, too. For the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. I never really thought about that. So, yeah, God is spirit, 
So you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three spirit, all one essence of God, this Godhead, and then you have uh, the, the Son manifest himself as a, in the flesh as a man, uh, die, dying for our, our sins, buried, raised from the dead, ascending to back to the Godhead, uh, uh, the uh, sitting on the throne next to the Father, the Holy Spirit coming down and dwelling all of us who put our faith in the Savior, Jesus. So uh, uh, that's kind of the role and interaction of, of, uh, of them all. But uh, yeah, I guess we can easily say God is spirit, therefore Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all spirit. This Godhead uh, whole idea is, is really hard to understand. I, yes. I've, tried to, I've tried to figure it out and explain it and discuss it with people over the years in so many different ways. And I, I think I've got some good ways of expressing it, but uh, a, none of them, none of them are really that satisfactory. That I feel like, oh, that's just, we we got it all figured out. <laughs> there's a there's a really funny video. It's about uh, by Lutheran sat satire. I think is the name of the YouTube page. It's called uh, Saint Patrick's Bad Analogies. It's it's hilarious. It's trying to describe the, the the Godhead and the Trinity. It's I'll have to share it to in the comments later. But mm -hmm. okay. Um, a book on heaven says, quote, the redeemed will see God not to be sure with physical eyes, unquote. But why not? The scene depicted in Revelation 20, chapter 22 comes after our bodily resurrection. Quote, the throne of God will be in the city and his servants will see his face, unquote. As physical beings, we will certainly we will certainly have physical eyes. How else should we expect to see God? Our resurrection bodies will have physical, spiritual eyes, untainted by sin, disease, or death. They will see far better than Moses' eyes, which allowed him to see an indirect manifestation of God's glory. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how anybody could come to the conclusion that we're not going to see God with physical eyes. That's a weird concept to even... Uh, promote. Well, I, I wouldn't be able to see him with physical eyes and, you know, you know glasses here. <laughs> I don't think you're going to need those glasses, brother, in eternity. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. Uh, I'm, I, you're, you're probably going to have like uh, uh, 20, not 2020 or, or 2100 or whatever you have now. You're, you're going to have like 20 times 0. .0001. Like... You can see everything. You can see. Maybe you can see the moon, the surface of the moon, all the grains of sand on the moon. That's just my theory. I don't know, but I, I believe we're going to have really good vision. Because yep. as it is right now, you know, if he was about twenty feet away, I'd be—I wouldn't know him from. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, will the Christ we worship in heaven as God also be a man? Yes, quote, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, <coughs> that's when he lived on earth, and today when he lives in the intermediate heaven, and forever when he will live on the new earth in the eternal heaven. That's Hebrews 13.8. I like how that breaks it down there in these three time frames. Yesterday, uh, I thought always thought of that verse as yesterday being in, back in times past through, in, through eternity. Um, and yet, I think he's, he may be right here, the way he's saying, uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, uh, meaning uh, when he was uh, living on earth before the, his uh, crucifixion. And today, he's living in the intermediate heaven, and forever, that will be on the new heavens, new earth, in eternity. Do you think that's an uh, accurate way of, of uh, understanding that verse? Can you, can you uh, repeat it one more time? Okay, uh, I'll read the verse and then I'll leave out his what he added to it. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So he's interjecting the points that yesterday means when he lived on the earth. Today is as he is now in the intermediate heaven. And forever is in the future, uh, in the uh, uh, eternal state on the new heaven, new earth. Uh, do you think that's a, a correct way of, of defining the yesterday, today, and forever? 
I don't know because yesterday could if, if it's trying to cover if it's trying to encompass his his whole whole existence then it talks about the time before he was born too I mean so if it means I don't know does it just is is it in, insinuating that it just stops at the time he was on the earth after his birth or before he was born being well, yesterday part of yesterday uh, I always thought the word forever was not referring to just from this point on into uh, into the future, mm -hmm. but also meant all times past. Okay, okay. So I, I would think to forget forever ties together the idea that he's always been the same, yeah. and then that would mean that he always had a physical body, and that would also make sense that we're made in his image. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Interesting points. Um, Christ didn't put on a body as if it were a coat. He didn't contain two separable, separable components, man and God, to be switched on and off at will. Rather, he was and is and will always be a man and God. That would be very interesting to see how a consensus opinion of this, this, this claim here is. Uh, how do you think that the, the Christian, Christians would divide over this question? Was he always man and God? Or only at, the, at his birth, his incarnation, did he become man and God? Well, there are definitely groups that see that differently. Um, yeah. yeah. I know there are. Um, to me, it would insinuate to me he, he was always the same. I mean, I, I don't think there should be a separation. Okay. Uh, what I want to do here is, I think I'll, uh, we'll make this a stop point, and uh, I'll, uh, to, end, to, to end the discussion for today, and it's not really at the end of a chapter or something, but I, I think that's because of the, the time frame we're working on, it'd be a good time to stop, and we'll pick it up right here uh, next time. Uh, let's use the remainder of the time to uh, kind of summarize our thoughts on anything we've discussed and then tell people how they can uh, have this eternal life. Um, we'll start with Brother, Brother Eric. Uh, you were here from the, the very beginning, so uh, mm -hmm. through the whole talk, uh, is there anything that stood out to you that's uh, worth really repeating and emphasizing? Well, I think I mean I know we've covered some of these subjects earlier, but um, you know I, again all of this is in a physical sense. Um, I know we didn't talk about it, but one of the great lines in Scripture that always I mean when you go way back into the beginning of Scripture in Job, uh, when when you when you're talking about Job and he says um, I know my Redeemer lives. In the end, he will stand upon the earth, and after with, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. He, I mean, he, even then, before Christ was even born, before Christ came, before he did what he did, before we were told about the resurrection, before we were told about, I mean, he knew and was and was confident in the fact. And he also says something to the effect that, um, um, how my heart yearns within me. I mean, he he was anticipating this, and back then. So this was not something that was new and came up later. This was something that was always known to believers. Um, back e even unto into Job's time, we talk about Enoch, who was in a way raptured, uh, who was caught away. Um, so, so this was this was a concept that was not new and came up later. This was something, and there are people out there who try to teach that that this was a new concept. It was actually taken from other ideologies, but it wasn't. This goes back into the Old Testament, well back to the time of Job, and even before that. Mm -hmm. I think the two main points we discussed today was this uh, idea of co uh, comparing this uh, uh, this new heaven, new earth as being familiar or not, and then the mm -hmm. idea of actually seeing God face to face. Uh, uh, let me get uh, Mike's uh, final uh, ideas on this, and then uh, Eric, I think you and I can kind of go back to that chart on page 255. Now, I'll, I'll just read one side as a paragraph, and you read the other side as a paragraph. That way people can see the uh, get an idea of the way people normally think about heaven and the mm -hmm. way the scripture says, you mm -hmm. know, really describes heaven. Mm -hmm. okay, but first, let's go to Brother Mike. Uh, 
anything that uh, you think is uh, you want to was uh, worth um, emphasizing? Yeah, I just really like you know kind of uh, pondering on what it's going to be like to meet God and the, the mentions of uh, I really like the, ex the different uh, ideas on on the expressions and our, our emotions and reactions to that and. Uh, and even the mention of the of the Godhead, it's just something that is truly you know, un understandable by our finite minds, and that it, it's going to be great to have that to learn, I guess, to learn that understanding in uh, in the next life. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, brother. Thank you. Uh, uh, Eric, I'll read the left side here, and then when I'm done, you you read the right side. Okay. And uh, I w I'm going to ask anybody who's watching this now, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, but how you view the afterlife, what happens after we we die, uh, how do you, what's your impression of what happens? And um, this is what is commonly assumed about heaven, and that is that it's there's not going to be on earth. Everything will be unfamiliar, otherworldly. Will be disembodied spirits. Everything will seem foreign to us. Uh, we're, we'll be leaving all our of our favorite things behind, and there's no time and space. Everything's going to be uh, st static without any change. Um, that things will be neither old or new, uh, just strange and unknown. There will be nothing to do. We'll just be floating in clouds. There'll be no learning or discovery because we'll just have instant, complete knowledge. Everything will be boring, and uh, we won't. We'll lose all of our desires and the absence of the terrible. Um, uh, but but the presence of, will be very little of uh, what we actually desire. That's okay. how that's how people commonly perceive eternity in heaven. I'd say just before I read the other side, I'd say yes, I absolutely agree with that list. I think most people do. When you when ask these questions, they'll at least answer with ninety percent of those those opinions. I think that's true. That's accurate. People assume that. Okay. But what the what the the Bible here, what Randy is saying, the Bible here actually states, and we've been studying and showing people, is that what it really says about heaven, about eternity, new heaven, new earth, that there will be a new earth, not a non earth, that it will be familiar. There will be earthly things about it. That we will be resurrected, not disembodied, which means we'll have bodies. We'll be embodied people. Um, it will be our home, and all the comforts of that home, with all the innovations of an infinitely creative God. Um, it will retain all the good things, and yet find the best things and even better things ahead. Um, there will be time and space, and it will be dynamic. There will be new things constantly happening, new things to learn and to, uh, to experience. Uh, there will be both old and new. Um, reminders of the old, uh, nostalgia like we talked about earlier, um, a God to worship face to face and serve, a universe to rule, uh, purposeful work to accomplish and friends to enjoy and to fellowship with in that time, uh, an eternity of learning and discovering. It will be fascinating. It will be continuous fulfillment of our desires and the presence of all the wonderful things and everything we desire and nothing we don't. Amen. Amen. So that should correct all the the common misconceptions about uh, our eternal existence. Those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ have that to look forward to. Everything that Eric described. If you thought that the description I gave was uh, was how you envision things, then that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Eric's description is correct. Okay. Uh, so now. Uh, again, let's end the program by telling people how they can have this eternal life uh, in this paradise on earth forever with these wonderful glorified bodies. They have super superpowers and just joy and bliss forever and ever. Uh, uh, how is it possible? How is it possible that a person can actually have that? What what do what do they have to do? Uh, Let's let me ask brother brother Mike to just state that, and then we'll have Eric uh, expound on it further. Well, uh, that that question is actually mentioned in scripture. What 
what must you do, uh, what must you work, you know, to work the works of God, you believe on the Son whom he has sent. You trust Jesus alone for salvation from your sin or disobedience against God. You're a sinner who's broken God's law, and you need a Savior from that sin, from the, uh, from the judgment to come. And either, at the end, God will either be your judge or your Savior, and just trust Jesus. Okay, brother. Thank you very much. And Eric? Um, you know, something, there was a line we read in the book today, and um, it talks a little bit about what we're facing, what we're up against here. We have a very real enemy that people want to assume doesn't exist. Uh, we have a very real enemy in Satan who doesn't want us to learn about these things, who doesn't want us to enjoy these things. And the line in the book, he says, here's no wonder Satan doesn't want us to learn the truth about heaven. And that is that is, a, I thought, one of the best lines we read today in the book because nothing could be further from the – I mean it is true. It is absolutely true that he does not want us to learn about heaven. And you know why? Because none of those things are awaiting him, and he knows it. He knows none of these things are in store for him. He knows they're in store for us, and he knows that God in his infinite mercy and his love for us has made it so easy for us – to God only demands one thing, and that's perfection. <laughs> and we can't be perfect. And he tells us that all through Scripture. And he tells us he doesn't expect us to be perfect. He expects Christ to do that work for us and for us to simply trust in what he did, to trust that what he did was enough. We talked about imputed righteousness and what was handed to us. Christ literally took his blood, washed us clean in what he had done. He became our sacrifice, the sacrifice we could never Never give to God on our behalf to cover, like Mike said, this debt, this amount that we owe, this prison sentence, this, this, all, all these things that we have to get rid of that we can't sponge away from our record. We can't get rid of it. But God has presented that way. He's given us that way, uh, that free way so easily, and that's why Satan hates it so much, and he wants us not to accept it. Learn more about heaven and the truth about heaven, because the more you learn about it, the more you'll want to go there and the more you'll want to experience it. And all you need to do to go there to experience it is to put your total trust and faith in what the Lord Jesus has done for you. That's all you have to do. Trust him, and he will bring you in. Amen. Amen. Uh, very well said, brothers. Um, the only thing that I would add for anybody who's watching this now is that uh, I want you to understand that this, this salvation, this eternal life that we're discussing, um, it, it is, the Bible refers to it as a gift, a free gift. Uh, so the problem with the world is that they think that uh, you have to somehow uh, please God through your own efforts by doing religious works, by living a good moral life, and people are struggling trying to trying to be good enough and satisfy God so that they can earn this eternal life. But the scripture says it's not something to be earned. We, no matter how hard we try to earn it, you could be the most religious person in the world, uh, and and yet you will fall short of the glory of God. But the good news is the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this eternal life is a free gift, and, and Jesus is offering it to you right now. Do you want it? If you want it, just reject yourself as being Savior. You can't save yourself and understand you need Jesus to save you. Trust him completely, and he gives you eternal life as a free gift. Please do it now. If you do, make a comment on this video. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.